Good evening, UBC family, uh, and welcome to another win wonderful Wednesday uh, of worship, uh, another wonderful power hour, hour of power in which we can come together and learn and study uh, and grow together in the law. Uh, so grateful for all of you who have joined us on uh, this Wednesday and every Wednesday uh, as we come together as a family uh, to learn more of the Lord, to study together to mature together, amen. I pray that you've had a wonderful Wednesday thus far. Uh, the reality is in spite of all that's happened on today, the God that we serve is still good. Uh, he is still amazing. He is still great and he is greatly to be praised. For this still is the day that the Lord has made. And I don't know about you, but I will rejoice and be glad in it, amen. Amen. So again, family, wherever you might be joining us from on this evening, we are grateful. We are thankful uh, that you are here with us on this Wednesday. Listen, real quick, family, uh, reach out to your family, reach out uh, to others in the ministry, reach out to your co-workers, uh, reach out to your friends. Selamis and Power Hour has started and you want them to be a part uh, of this experience. So hit them up. Tell them, come on. We waiting on you. We ready to go. Uh, we want them to be here. Uh, so shoot them a text, hit them up on Facebook, uh, hit them up on Instagram, whatever you got to do and tell them, come on, now is the time um, for our hour of power. Amen. Uh, fam, just want to share a couple of things with you uh, and then we'll get ready to jump into our lesson on tonight. So excited about um, our lesson that we're going to share on, on this evening. First of all, just a reminder, this Friday, this Friday, uh, that is Good Friday, this Friday evening, uh, at 7 p.m., all roads lead uh, to the United Baptist Church, uh, where our UI ministry will be uh, once again uh, hosting our last seven uh, words of Christ. Amen. Uh, that is this Friday evening uh, at the United Baptist Church. We're at 1007 uh, South Hawkins Avenue, Akron, Ohio, 44320. Uh, we have some wonderful women of God coming to share on Friday evening. Uh, so you want to get there, get there early so you can get a seat. Uh, but service starts at 7 p.m. That is this Friday, this Friday, 7 p.m. at the United Baptist Church. So again, uh, share that with everyone, spread the word, tell them they don't want to miss this, this Friday evening at the United Baptist Church. Uh, and again, then just want to remind everyone, as I did on Sunday, um, the West Akron 5K race, we're in our 11th year this year. We're so excited about all that God has done, uh, but we need your help. We need your support. Hey, Amen. you can go to westakron5k.com. Registration is now open. Registration is now open. You can even use the QR code uh, that's right there on your screen so that you can register. Uh, you can register today. Registration is $30. Um, that includes your shirt. Uh, for the race, we want you to register early um, so that, again, uh, we can do all that we can to support uh, the schools there uh, in West Akron, where our church is located. Uh, we want to be a blessing to that cluster of kids uh, to be able to support them uh, and those schools. And so everything that we raise after we pay our, our few expenses goes to those four schools. This last year, uh, we donated six thousand dollars. Um, that is $1,500 a piece uh, to Helen Arnold, to Krauss, uh, to Buchto, and to Schumacher. Uh, and we want to do even better this year uh, than we did last year. So listen, we need your help. We need your support. Uh, I believe over our time in doing this, uh, I believe we've donated uh, over $60,000 to these schools in our communities. Um, so listen, family, we, we can do better. We can do more. Uh, but we need your help. So get registered. I tell y'all every year, uh, some of y'all say, well, Pastor, you know I don't run. That's all right. Uh, if you don't run, you can walk. Some of you say, well, Pastor, I'll run or walk. That's right. If you don't run, you don't walk, you can still donate. Uh, so please, man, please, sir, go there now, register uh, so you can be a part uh, of this wonderful event. It is August the 3rd, first Saturday in August, always the first Saturday in August, August 3rd, 2024, uh, we'll be at uh, Book to CLC, that is 1040 Copley Road. All my griffs who are out there, uh, we're going to be at 1040. We start at 9 a.m. Uh, come out. We're going to have screenings available so that you can be screened uh, and then you can take part 
uh, in the race. Amen. Uh, and again, just also want to remind you all every Wednesday, uh, every Wednesday, uh, we have our power hour, our noonday power hour, which is in person um, there at the Gus Johnson Community Center, um, 1015 South Hawkins Avenue, Akron, Ohio. If you're in the Akron, uh, Canton, Cleveland, Youngstown area, uh, you're welcome to join us 12 noon every Wednesday. Uh, and then at 6.15 p.m., uh, you can call into our prayer call uh, for our prayer meeting. Um, every Wednesday, it starts at 6.15, uh, and then come right on uh, and join us at 7 p.m. Uh, for our virtual power hour. Amen. Uh, amen. So let me see uh, who we have out here with us uh, on this evening, joining us uh, for power hour on this evening, as I share with you all um, every week. Listen, if you just drop uh, a comment there in the comment section, uh, pastor's able to see that you're out there, that you're part of this, um, so that we can shout you out. So let me see who we have with us this evening. Hey, Miss Felicia uh, Douglas, Mother Thelma, so glad y'all with us. Hey, Miss Yvonne Bonner, so glad you with us this evening. Hey, Miss Jeanette, uh, Miss Andy Stevens, how you doing? Uh, Brother John Brown, how you doing this evening? Uh, Miss Jackie Bailey, so glad you with us. Hey, Miss Tony Addy, love y'all. Uh, Sister Kisa, uh, so glad you with us. Hey, Miss Alice Razor. Um, my sister says, Bam Curry, how you doing? Uh, Miss Carolyn Relaford, how are you this evening? Uh, so glad that you are with us. Uh, so glad that you're here. Minister Tricia, uh, so glad you're with us. Minister Peggy Tuck, good to see you. Uh, Reverend Tracy Lee, y'all, Reverend Tracy Lee is home. She is home, y'all. Uh, our God is awesome. She is home, uh, recuperating, getting better. Uh, I'm sure the hospital is glad that she is home. Uh, I'm sure the facility uh, that had to take care for them couple weeks is glad that she is home. Uh, and I'm, we as a family uh, are so glad and grateful uh, that she is home. So, so good to see Reverend Tracy Lee. Miss Wendy Corbin, how are you this evening? Uh, so glad that you're with us. Hey, Miss Teresa, uh, hopefully you and mother are doing well. Hey, Miss Tamika, uh, Brother Lenny, Miss Didi, how y'all doing? Hey, Miss Phyllis, uh, Preacher, see you out there with us this evening. Deacon Robbie, how you doing? Uh, Reverend Lisa Jones, how are you? Uh, so glad that you are. Uh, hey, uh, Bishop Terrence Duncan, how you doing this evening, brother? Uh, Rem Hooks, so glad to see you, man. Uh, hey, Miss Didi, little Miss Didi, uh, so glad that y'all are with us uh, on this evening as we get ready uh, to start our power hour uh, on tonight. Uh, amen. Family, listen, let's let's pray, uh, and then we'll jump right into our uh, lesson on this evening. Uh, again, want to remind all of you. Uh, this Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, uh, Resurrection Sunday morning, we we're excited uh, as we make our way through Holy Week uh, to come to the conclusion uh, and our time of celebration of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, so please come out. Service starts at 10 a.m. Uh, you want to get there a little early, make sure that you have uh, space, uh, as I'm sure we'll have some visitors, some people uh, joining us for our resurrection service. Uh, on this Sunday. So again, inviting all of you, family and friends, to join us, whether it's virtual or in person. If you're in that area, uh, join us Sunday morning for Resurrection Sunday service. I'm excited. My youth are going to be leading service. Uh, they're going to do their Resurrection Sunday speeches. Uh, so I'm excited uh, about our service on this Sunday. Family, let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you so much for this day that you have made. We thank you for all that you've done for us on today. Uh, God, we, we dare not go any further uh, without showing our gratitude and our appreciation uh, for who you are and for all that you've done. Uh, God, the only reason we are where we are right now is because you brought us, is because you've kept us, is because you've covered us, is because you've sustained us, it's because you've given us the strength. Uh, so God, as we gather tonight to learn of you, to grow in you, God, prepare our hearts and our minds, allow us to be receptive of all that you share on tonight, God. Help us as we continue to seek you, to seek your will, uh, to seek your way, uh, to learn more of you. Help us to be more like Christ. Show us what we need to do. Correct us, challenge us, encourage us, uplift us on tonight. Father, if we ever needed you before, we shall need you right now. So God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. Pour now into us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Family, 
Um, we are moving into Romans chapter nine. Uh, Romans chapter nine. We concluded last week uh, the eighth chapter of Romans. We've been doing this this study on the book of Romans uh, since uh, last year, um, and so we want to continue with our study on the night. So we are moving into the ninth chapter uh, of Romans. So listen, let me just share with you on the onset um, that, that we're going to start probably one of the more challenging sections of Romans and perhaps uh, one of the most challenging sections of the Bible here, Romans chapter nine. Uh, it, it is truly a challenging chapter, uh, especially for us, uh, the believer, uh, but for all of us, uh, because if you if you ever wanted to know how uh, we need to deal with and how we need to understand uh, how God operates and how God moves uh, and what God does, th th this is the chapter that will reveal it to you. Uh, but you're going to have to hold on. Yeah, it, it's important uh, at the onset for me to tell you, uh, for us to understand all of this um, with this lesson on tonight and also uh, receive the fact that you might not perfectly understand all that I share on tonight. That's all right. Uh, you, you might have some more questions. That's why we had a comment section. If you have a question, you can drop it there uh, in the comment section on tonight. Uh, you, you might have, after we get done tonight, a few more questions, then you do answers. Uh, but here it is with God's help on tonight. Uh, we're going to get some understanding. All right. So, so family, uh, we, we got to remember that as, as we study, as we get ready to go into this chapter, this passage, um, I, I just want to share with you, uh, first of all, uh, just a, a little premise, a little foundational uh, for this. And so as we study this passage, understand that God is God. And we are not God. I also need to tell you, you need to remember uh, that God has given us his truth for our benefit. I need to lay this foundation. Uh, that, that he has revealed some of who he is, some of what he does, and some of why he does it in scripture. He, he, he's even revealed some of who he is in your life, revealed some of what he does, revealed why he does it in our lives, some of it. However, family, the reality is God has not revealed everything to us. He has not revealed everything to us. And here's, here's, the, here's, here's the precipice. And he is not duty bound to reveal everything to us. Here's where I want to share with you that we're going to walk through this together. God don't owe us any explanation. Told y'all this is gonna be a challenge. Yeah, the, the part of our problem that we have is we think God is supposed to explain everything to us, and that He is supposed to help us understand everything, every decision He makes, uh, makes uh, the reason why He would do it, uh, what you know, uh, how He's gonna do it. Yeah, we, we got to remember what Isaiah fifty-five, Reverend Hooks tells us. He says, "For my thoughts are not your thoughts." Right. That God, you, your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's de declaration for as high as heaven uh, is higher than the earth. So are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. I, I need you to hold on and grab hold of that as we get ready to walk into Romans chapter nine. I, I think it's going to help some of us. Uh, change our minds and change our hearts in, in how we address God uh, and our expectations uh, from God. Y'all with me so far? So we closed out chapter eight. And Paul has talked to us about uh, the beautiful saving love of God and how nothing can separate us uh, from the love of God. There's a whole lot to shout about in Romans chapter eight, right? Uh, we, we learn that therefore there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. We learn that if God before us, who can be against us? We learn that all things work together for the good of them who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. We learn that the nothing 
shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. A whole lot to shout about in Romans chapter eight. Uh, can't tell you we're going to do a whole lot of shouting in chapter nine, uh, but we're going to learn some things. All right. Uh, so first, let, let's let's go go with me. Romans chapter nine. Hopefully you brought your Bibles with you. Uh, about something you can take some notes with. Uh, Reverend Tracy Lee, we're going to have to hold on uh, to get through this one. Uh, Romans chapter nine, starting at verse number one. I'm going a, I'm to a make my way down through verse number 13. Uh, we're going to see how far we get. Uh, but we're going to start our reading, starting at verse one, down through verse number 13. Uh, and if, if God allow us more time, we're going to try to work our way all the way uh, through this chapter on tonight. Romans chapter nine, starting at verse number one, reading from the New American Standard Bible. So if you were to look there, you find these words are some similar to, I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ, according to the flesh, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac, your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebecca also when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. It is said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just that is is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Uh, the grass withers and the flower fades, uh, but the word of our God uh, shall stand forever. So family, let, let's, we, we got a whole lot to unpack. So let's, uh, let, let's start to look at uh, this plan uh, God has for his people. This plan that God has for his people. So Paul starts out these first couple of verses here uh, with, with, with his statement and his sorrow, his grief, right? P Paul starts out this chapter, Terrence, in a very peculiar way. He, I, I, I had to read it a couple of times when I came across it in order to catch it. Some of y'all probably missed it when I read it. But the first thing that Paul says in this text is, uh, he, he tells us, here's what he says. He said, he ain't lying. He said, I, I'm, I, I'm not lying. I, I, I didn't make it up. It's right there in the text if you read it. Now, now it's not as though Paul was usually lying to people, uh, but he wants to be sure that the people of Rome, the believers at Rome, are paying attention to what he's about to tell them. That, that what, what he's going to say uh, in a few places in this text, uh, that it's going to be strange and it's going to uh, be uncomfortable for his readers. So Paul says at the onset, he said, listen, y'all, I ain't lying to y'all. I, I, I wouldn't do that. He says, my conscience testifies to me through the Holy Spirit. So Paul is telling the truth. He's serious. And God has put this on his heart. So here's the question. So, so Pastor, why would the folk think that Paul is lying? Why, why, why would they think that Paul 
ain't telling him the truth. So he starts out by telling him he has a great sorrow and uneasy anguish in his heart. Right now, that ain't too crazy. Many of us at times have sorrow and anguish in our hearts. But Paul's anguish has grown out of his love for his for his own Jewish people. You see, Paul realizes that many of his brothers and sisters in Judaism have rejected Jesus, the Messiah. Yeah, he, he, he understands, he knows that a rejection of Jesus means a rejection of God. Paul knows that those Jewish people who have rejected Jesus have rejected all of his promises and his blessings that God provides, including an eternal home in heaven with God. So Paul says, I'm, 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 I'm grieved, I'm, I'm sorrowful, I'm, I'm dealing with anguish. Why? Because folk I identify with have rejected the Lord. And so he's trying to get their attention. He's trying to get them to understand what's going on. But then he, he makes uh, Minister Peggy Tuck a very peculiar statement in verse 3. Uh, he says, for I, I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the benefit of my brothers and sisters, my own flesh and blood. So he, 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 here's what Paul is saying. I need y'all to catch this. Paul is saying, I would be willing to lose my own salvation if it meant that the Jewish people would come to Jesus. I ain't make it up as there in the text. Now, the good thing is uh, I don't control my own salvation yet. Yeah, the scripture tells me that who the father has in his hand, nobody, not even me, can pluck himself out. But listen to the heart of Paul. Paul says, "I, if I could, I would be willing to lose my own salvation if it meant that the rest of y'all would come to Jesus. Now, I'm, I'm just going to be honest. Listen, I ain't sure I could say that. And I love I love all y'all to death. Lord, those I do love y'all. Um, but that's heavy. I, I'm not sure, like Paul, that I, I that I'd be willing, Trace Lee, to give up my own salvation in order for all of Akron to come to Jesus or all of Ohio or all of Louisiana all of Florida, uh, for, for Trump and all the other folk to come to Jesus or all of America to come to Jesus. That That's Paul. Paul, if I could, I, I would I would be cursed and cut off for Christ for the benefit of my brothers and sisters, my own flesh and blood. So so now you hear Paul, that's why Paul had to tell him, I said, listen, I ain't lying. I'm telling y'all the truth. I'd give up my own salvation if that meant all the rest of y'all would get saved. I, I, essentially, Paul said, listen, if I, I would spend eternity in hell if it meant the rest of y'all would know Jesus. Oh, that's heavy. So, so Paul is expressing this tremendous burden to see the folk he identifies with to come to Jesus. Right, they, they are God's chosen people in the Old Testament. And Paul wants them to receive all the benefits. He wants them to understand all of the blessing of being God's people. And he's burdened that the very people who God has chosen won't choose him. And so Paul is grieved. This is a statement of sorrow. He understands that his salvation in Christ is a precious thing that he has. And here it is. He wants everybody else to have it. Even, Paul says in this, some people think being, uh, showing too much hyperbole. You know, some would say, well, now, Paul didn't really mean that. Maybe he was just exaggerating over the, over the top. But that's why Paul starts out, I ain't lying. I would give up my own if it meant you would know Jesus. Tell somebody that's heavy. That's a whole lot. Can we go a little further? 
So not only do we see this statement and sorrow that Paul starts out with, but then he starts to talk about the Israelites' blessings and bird and boundaries. Their blessings and boundaries. You gotta, he he gonna help us understand more of what this grief was about. As he starts to highlight some things about the Israelites. Right? Paul, Paul has a great desire to see the Israelite people come to Jesus. After all, they are they are special people. They are the ones who descended from Abraham, the chosen one. They are the ones God adopted as his own. They are the ones to whom God showed his glory. They are the ones with whom God made many covenants. They are the ones to whom God uh, first gave his law. They are the ones to whom God gave the temple. They are the ones to whom God delivered many promises. Through them, the great ancestors of the faith came. Through them, Jesus, the Messiah came. All of these miraculous and wonderful blessings came through the Israelite people. They are indeed, family, a special people. However, there are also boundaries for the Israelites. They cannot simply do anything they want to do and ignore the ways of God. Paul wants them to know, I don't care how special you are. I don't, it, I don't care how, who your descendants all are. I know you connected Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all the way down. He's like, but understand this, you can't reject God in Christ and expect everything to be all right. Because remember, we'll back up a couple of chapters uh, when they thought, listen, because we connected to Abraham, we we good. It don't matter what else we do. We we in we in the family. We can do whatever we want to do. Paul says, no, mm -mm. you can't reject God and Christ and think everything going to be all right. So then he poses a question to them in, in, in verse six. You know, if if the word of God it, it, has the word of God failed. You, you see, God made the promises concerning Israel, yet Israel had rejected their own Messiah. They had rejected God. So here's the question. Have the promises of God towards his people failed? Absolutely not. Paul points out that not all of the children of God have failed. He says in verse seven, not all who, this is so important, who are descended from Israel are Israel. Y'all still got your Bibles open. Let, let's, let's go back. Let's go back to this. Um, verse six, pick up verse six. But is it, But is it not as though the word of God has failed? For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. So what Paul is saying is that just because someone is Jewish doesn't really mean that they are actually one of God's chosen people. Just because, let me see if I can say it another way, just because they are in the lineage don't mean they are linked to Jesus. Oh, God. Let, let me bring it in a little closer. Uh, just because they know the dress code and the holidays and the kosher meals don't mean they have a relationship. Yeah, just because you tune in via social media on Sundays and Wednesdays, just because you know the church lingo and wear church clothes, uh, just because you were raised in the church and know how to say a prayer when you're in trouble, don't mean you have a relationship with Jesus. Yeah, yeah just because you descended from spirit field, tongue talking, fire baptized, prayer closet praying parents and grandparents and godparents don't mean you saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. The Bible told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Paul says, I ain't lying to y'all. I'm trying to tell y'all the truth. You have to have a relationship. You can't have rejected Jesus and think everything is all right. The very people of Israel had experienced tremendous blessings and there was more to come. However, the true blessings are reserved for those who are true followers of God and of Christ our Messiah. Paul would love to see his people come to Jesus. 
But he understands, here it is, not all will because they have rejected Christ. Paul know what he's talking about. Why? Because he was one of the folk who used to reject it until his experience on the Damascus Road. Paul thought he was doing everything right when he was Saul, when he was going out killing believers. He's trying to get them to understand. You can't reject the Lord. It's all right that you looked apart. It's all right that people identify you as a Jew. But what really matters is, do you have a relationship with God through Christ Jesus? This is the challenge that Paul is presenting to the people. But wait, he goes a little further. He starts to talk about the promise and purpose. I'm, I'm, I'm walking right through this thing. Are y'all walking with me? We see this in why the people reject Christ. Paul says, starting in verse 8, that it is not as important as to whether or not one is a physical descendant of Abraham. Because for them, that was it. We connected Abraham. We good. We connected to Isaac. We good. We connected. We in the lineage of Jacob. We straight. And so what Paul wants the people to, to look at, what is more important is whether or not someone is a child of the promise. Versus just being someone in the lineage. Well, who are who are the children of promise? Because that's what they believe that we the children of promise. You know, we 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 are in this lineage of the promise that happened with Abraham and been passed all the way down. So Paul begins to trace who the children are, beginning with Abraham. He says in verse nine that Sarah, the wife of Abraham, would have a son. Uh, this would be a promised son, not just any son. This would be Isaac, right? The promised son. We walk her through Old Testament. Then Isaac's wife, Rebecca, would have a promised son. However, she messed around, had twins. And then this is where we see the mysterious and sovereign hand of God at work. Pay attention to this. The text tells us so that God's purpose might stand, Jacob was chosen over Esau. Now, when you hear that, we might be tempted to think that God chose Jacob to be the child of promise over Esau because God knew Jacob would turn out better. Right? That, that's, that, that would be easy for us to make that conclusion. You know what? God already knew Jacob was going to turn out to be better anyway, and that's why he chose him. But pay attention because Paul gives more clarity to the reason God chose Jacob. Scripture says God chose Jacob when her sons had not been born yet. That God chose Jacob when they had not done anything good or bad. That God chose Jacob so that God's purpose according to election might stand. That God chose Jacob not from works. That God chose Jacob from the one who calls, of course, meaning God himself. So we wanted to deduce that God chose Jacob because uh, of the life that Jacob lived, right? But do you know what kind of man Jacob was? For most of his life, Jacob, the trickster, was a scoundrel, right? J Jacob did all he could, along with his mama, to get to the top. Did his family wrong? Did his brother wrong? And yet God said before any of that was ever even established, I had already chosen. And, and, and preacher here, you're like this. One commentator said, I had to drop this in your spirit. One commentator said, the amazing thing isn't that God didn't choose Esau. The amazing thing is that God did choose Jacob. Oh, God. So before the twins were ever even born, their mother, Rebecca, was told that Esau would serve Jacob. Now, that, that's unusual. That's a break in Jewish custom that the younger son would receive the blessing of God. 
But the text says that Jacob would be loved by God. Let's put that in this context, meaning he would be blessed by God. And Esau would be hated by God. Let's put it in context, meaning being rejected by God. In essence, God said, my plan that I'm establishing is through Jacob. And Paul says that this was all so that God's purpose according to election might stand. What is election, Pastor? I'm so glad you asked. It refers to God's sovereign choice to bring about his purposes on the earth. His sovereign choice. You're going to hear me say that word a whole lot of more times tonight. His sovereign choice. Jacob, the one who wrestles. Jacob, the one who God chose. And, and listen, Jacob, Jacob has some things to get right in his life. Him and Esau end up... Uh, getting back together. But God said, listen, ain't none of that have to do. I didn't make it up. It's right there in verses 11 and 12. Her sons had not even been born yet when God decided this. They hadn't done anything good or bad, right? That this was according to God's election that it might stand, that it was not about their works. It is about the one who calls. So God knew from the beginning he wanted to use to bring about who he wanted to use to bring about his purpose and nothing they did curry or could do would override god doing what he needed to do to bring about his divine purpose same way here it is the same way he used moses he also used pharaoh the same way he used david he also used nebuchadnezzar the same way he used Gideon, he also used Abimelech. The same way he used Jesus, he also used Judas. Teach Russian, I'm doing the best I can. God has made a promise to call his children to himself. And he has purposed from the foundation of the world to elect his people, not just Jewish people, but people from every tribe, every tongue and nation. And he is calling them to himself so that they may call upon him and be saved from their sins. And God says, I'll use whatever mechanism necessary. I can do what I want, when I want, how I want, using whomever I want. Why? Because I am God and God all by myself. I told y'all this was going to get real tonight. That's a whole lot to unpack. This is what Paul is stressing to the people. Y'all think y'all special, but the truth of the matter is if you don't have a relationship with God, you ain't really that special at all. That, that throughout your history, God has been using people so that you could serve him and follow him and choose him. And yet along the way, you wanted to do what you wanted to do. So I had to even use folk outside of you in order to get you back where I needed you to be. Don't, I'm God. Oh, it gets better. Y'all still with me on the night, aren't y'all? Listen, we're gonna roll through this thing. Let's pick up verse number 14. Cause if you thought God was done, Paul said, no, I need to I, I need to break this down to you because here it is, this is, this is gonna do, so Paul is about to do the same thing some of y'all doing getting you questions and any good teacher uh any good teacher any good preacher uh when they look at a text when they study the text they'll be asking questions why because what you want to do on the front end uh, is try to address all the questions that the people might have or might ask as you go through the lesson so you you already asking yourselves some of these questions so what paul is about to do from verse 14 on down is try to address the questions he know they got so here it is. Pick it up with me. Verse 14. What shall we say then? That there is, no, there is no injustice with God, is there? God wouldn't do injustice, would he? May it never be, Paul says. Let's answer this question. May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. 
and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Oh, y'all need to highlight, underline, underline that. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for the very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? On the contrary, Paul says, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? Highlight, circle, underline, verse number 20. You want to hold on to that. The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump, one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us, whom, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. As he says also in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they should be called the sons of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord of Sabbath had left us to posterity, he would have become like Sodom and would have resembled Gramor. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attain righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel pursuing a law of righteousness did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as though it were by works, they stumbled over the stumbling stone. Just as it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stone a stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. We got work to do, family. Let's let's walk. Let's walk through this. So the God's sovereign choices, God's sovereign choice. So in this passage, Paul seems to anticipate again. Many of the readers of the book of Romans uh, will want to question what God is doing when it comes to His sovereign work from heaven that he is carrying out among his people. In fact, Paul begins the passage with these words, what shall we say then? Is there injustice with God? That's a serious question. Understanding God's sovereignty in the world is extremely important. If we misunderstand who God is, it messes up everything else in our lives. So here continues the idea of election. This idea that God chooses someone to be a part of his promise, that God chooses. So Paul starts to give examples like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? The truth in the text is that God's children are not necessarily those who are physically, again, descended from Abraham, but those who are children of the promise. So Paul Pursuing this idea lets the people, first of all, know, here it is, verse 14, he lets them know it's God's choice. Is there injustice with God? Since God is choosing Jacob over Esau, is that unfair? Esau was the firstborn. 
Is that is 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 that injustice that he decided to put Jacob over his older brother? Since some people are children of the promise and some are not, is a justice happening? Is God unjust? Paul says, no, we need to answer this immediately. Absolutely not. Paul said, let's be clear. God is not unjust. And God is not unfair in any way. In his explanation to this declaration, Paul references God showing mercy to the people, to the children of Israel in the Old Testament. That he showed forgiveness to the people after they greatly sinned against him when Moses was leading them, right? Short, shortly after uh, this moment, God met with Moses uh, as the people decided, you know, we're going to make our own God. We're going to make our own idol. We don't, we don't need that God that Moses keeps talking about. We're going to make our own God. And the truth of the matter is the people did not deserve mercy. The people whom God had laid out, who had led out of slavery and bondage in Egypt, the people who God had kept that had been a, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire uh, by night, the, the the very blessings of God who poured and rained down manna so that they could have it, who bought water out of a rock, who allowed them to defeat enemies that should have crushed them. And yet these very people decide to come up with a false deity, worshiping a man-made item. And the truth of the matter is they did not deserve the mercy of God and Paul says, and yet God decided to show mercy. Why? Because the sovereign God, Paul says, can show mercy when he wants to show mercy. It is God's decision to whom God will show mercy. It is, tell somebody, it's God's choice. You might not think it's fair. But it's God's choice. Wait. It's not only God's choice. Paul also lets us know it's God's reason. It's God's reason. God is not only able to make a sovereign choice about showing mercy to people, but God does so for his own reasons. And here's the reality, family. You ain't got to understand the reason. At times, God gives us a peek behind the curtain to see why he makes the choices that he makes. But most of the time, he does it because here it is. It's his business. Let me give this to y'all. Uh, y'all, hold on. The problem many of us have in this relationship with God through Christ Jesus is we think we supposed to be able to tell the father what the father is supposed to do. We think in this relationship that we have, because God is merciful and God is loving, he is the God uh, who is love. So we, we think what we try to do is take advantage of the relationship. So we think God's supposed to tell us why, and God's supposed to give us the reason why he does what he does. The point that we miss a lot of times, Reverend Lisa Jones, is the fact that everywhere you look at those of us who relate, those of us who accepted Christ as our personal savior, that here it is. We are the children of God. Look at your Bible. They were the children of Israel. Those of us who accept Christ as our personal savior, we are the children of God. He's our father. But the problem some of us have is we think we the father and he the child. So we've constructed in our minds that we have the ability to go to God and say, God, you need to tell me why you did what you did. You need to break this down to me and give me the reason why you're letting me go through what I'm going through, but letting them get away with what they're getting away with. You need to explain to me why in the world I got to suffer like this. And this one over here who ain't coming to worship, who ain't thinking about you, look like they live in a very much more successful life than I am. When the reality is, here it is, hold on to this. God ain't got to give you no reason. Oh, teach Russian. I told y'all this was hard when I when I read it and studied it. This is hard. Lord, the truth of the matter is God ain't your child. And he ain't ever got to give us a reason why he does what he does 
or allows what he allows. You got you to gotta wrap your arms around that. God don't need to or have to give us a reason for anything he does. It's a blessing if God reveals to you why he does what he does. But you could go the rest of your days never knowing the reason why God allowed you to go through what you went through. So Paul recounts. What the Lord says to Pharaoh through Moses, God tells Pharaoh that he is using him. Now, y'all know Pharaoh. Pharaoh ain't never thought about serving the Lord. He ain't never thought about serving God. God tells Pharaoh that he is using him to show his greatness, not only to the children of Israel, but to the whole earth. So God worked miracles to deliver the children of Israel and all the people who surrounded Egypt would have a front row seat to witness the greatness of God through what God did with the exodus of his people. And Pharaoh, God used by it is hardening his heart. And that's why verse 18 of the text says, he has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy. And he hardens whom he wants to harden. Here the problem, you say, well, Pastor, it don't make sense. Why would God harden anybody? Because he's God. And he don't have to justify or explain to us the reason he does what he does. God may choose to work through people like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Noah, David, and Paul, you and me. But then likewise, he may choose to work through someone's evil and even harden them as he did with Pharaoh and King Saul and King Nebuchadnezzar and Judas and others. Why does God do that? Why does God do what he does? And why does he do it the way that he does? Listen, church, it's God's choice and it's God's reason. But wait, here the third one. Y'all still with me, ain't you, on the night? Not only is it God's choice, not only is it God's reason, it's God's prerogative. H have you ever said these words to a child, whether it's yours or somebody else, or perhaps uh, to an employee, uh, a student, or someone who is under your authority? Have you ever said these words? Here it is, because I said so. Yep. Because I said so. I didn't I didn't I didn't I didn't heard that uh in 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 Carolyn's rushing the house many a day. Um when I when I for some reason uh thought that I was grown enough to ask her why, uh her answer simply was uh because I said so. Uh now most of us understand uh that there's a certain right uh that should be given to a person who's in authority to do what they choose to do. In essence, what my mother was telling me was boy. I don't have to give you an explanation. I'm the parent, you the child, because I said so. That's the answer. Why we got it? Because I said we got to go. Why Why we got to eat? Because I said so. That mm, end of the conversation. That's it. We don't pass. We don't pass. Go. We don't collect two hundred dollars because I said so. So then, so much greater than family is God's prerogative, again, to show mercy to whomever he chooses, to show mercy and to not show mercy to whomever he chooses. It's his prerogative. What's a prerogative, Pastor? It's a right or privilege exclusive to a particular individual. So God alone has the right and the privilege to work his plan and purpose among his people. It's his prerogative. So Paul anticipates another question that's going to come from this. So if God is the one who chooses to show mercy, and if he does so for his own reason, why are we still held accountable for how we respond to God? Paul acknowledges that God is all powerful and his will cannot be resisted. In other words, if God purposes for something to happen, it's going to happen. 
But Paul's response is a question. He says, when or why then does he still find fault? But what, how, how can he still find fault if he the one, it's his prerogative, he the one doing it? Sort of reminds me of a child who screams at his or her parents that they are unfair and that they don't understand how life works. Like, my, I don't know why, you just don't understand. You just don't, you don't get it, right? Or, or, or like an employee who tells a founder of a company uh, that they don't know how to run a successful business. Or, or like an uncommitted church member who got the audacity to show up to a church meeting uh, and tell a dedicated pastor after years of ministry experience that they don't know what they do in leading the church. In these situations, you sort of want to respond. How dare you even think for a second that you know what you're talking about? How, how, how are you going to tell me about parenting and you don't know nothing about parenting? How are you going to tell me about running the business and you you, you couldn't run water good? How, how are you going to tell me about leading church and you don't even part of nobody's church? Similarly, Paul wants to know who are you to talk back to God? Who are you to question God's prerogative? Who, who are you that you think you are owed an explanation for what God has done? Here it is. If God decides to explain himself, if he decides to show mercy, it's his prerogative. To, to, to help us understand this reality, Paul provides an illustration of a potter and clay. If the potter wants to use a chunk of clay to make a beautiful sculpture, he can do it. And you could be that beautiful sculpture. But, but also, Mother Thelma, if God decides he wants to mold you into a bowl so that you can hold scraps from the table, that is God's prerogative. And the clay has no right to complain to the potter. It's God's prerogative to work amongst his creation, however he chooses to do so. You, you trying to tell God it ain't fair. And God is saying, I'm the one who chose you. I'm the one who called you. I'm the one who led you to repentance. I'm the one who loves you. I'm the one who keeps you and sustain you. I'm the one who chooses you, adopted you, sanctified you, redeemed you. And you got nerve enough Talk back to your father because you don't agree with his prerogative. Because you don't agree with his choices. It's God's choice. It's God's prerogative. God can do what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, where he wants to do it, how he wants to do it, to whom he wants to do it. He's the one with all wisdom, all knowledge, all power. He is uh, omniscient. He's omnipresent. He is sovereign. He knows exactly what he's doing. So we have to recalibrate this relationship. We the children. He's our father. He don't owe us anything an explanation a reason this is why god we pray in all of our getting god just help us to understand but that is not a prerequisite it is not a command or a demand how paul says it in, in, in another place he's who can understand the mind of god certainly we couldn't how, how can an, an infinite mind, how can a finite mind understand an infinite mind? How, how can finite purpose understand infinite purpose? So this is where Paul says we got to check ourselves. He's the potter, I'm the clay. Whatever he chooses to do, he's, listen, that doesn't wipe out the promises. It's still that all things are going to work together for the good of them who love God 
It is that therefore there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That there's still, if God before us, who is who can be against us, it's still nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. All of that's still true, but you got to stay in your place. Paul says you got to remember who God is. God can show mercy to whomever he wants to show mercy to. God can heal whomever he chooses to heal. God can allow your children and your uh, person that you love pass from this place. God can do it because he's God. And we as his children, we as his, as his disciples have no right to demand an explanation from God. All we can do, God, is ask. Help us to understand. Help us to live according to the plan that you put in place, even when it don't make sense to us. Because all of God's choices don't have to make sense to me. All that God decides to do, all of his reasoning don't have to make sense to me. His prerogative don't have to make sense to me. How he uses, who he uses does not have to make sense to me. He the one in control. So we have to rethink in this relationship, how we interact, how we approach our God. Family, that is Romans chapter nine. I hope y'all held on. I hoped uh, you all picked up, learned something uh tonight thank y'all so much for for listening uh thank y'all so much uh for going with me through i know that was a whole lot uh again read it again for yourself walk through it uh, there, there's a lot there but paul wants us to understand you gotta know your place you got you gotta recognize first of all that god is important you can't reject him you can't be without him then you also got to understand uh, that God does what God does, and you don't have to agree with it. You you, you don't have to understand it all. You, you you don't you don't have to recognize His reasons and His prerogative. Your responsibility is to still be faithful to Him. Amen. Family, listen. If tonight's lesson was a blessing to you, will you join me uh, in being a blessing to God? Uh, so many ways in which you can give. You can utilize. Uh, cash app you can text to give uh you can go to paypal uh, you can go to our website uh you can mail it in to us uh, by whatever means let's just be a blessing to god for all uh, that he has shared on tonight for all that he has exposed us to uh on tonight amen thank you to those of you uh who joined pastor in in sowing a seed uh on tonight thank you for for your offering on tonight Pray that God uh, will receive it uh, and that you would reap the blessing from your sacrifice on tonight. God, we thank you for your truth on tonight. We thank you for your revelation. Now, God, help us as we go forth fulfilling your will in our lives. God, we may not always understand it, rather than always wanting to ask why or whether always wanting to ask you to give us a reason god just help us understand that we may continue to follow you that we may continue to trust you because you're our father it's in christ's name we pray amen family thank you so much for joining on tonight listen stay safe be blessed uh, we'll see you soon. Don't forget Good Friday service, 7 p.m. Resurrection Sunday morning service at 10 a.m. Family be blessed.